The next talk is by Ben, ben Wilson. Well, thank you, Dimitri, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a topic that I got interested in uh, when I was an undergrad in Joanna Maisel's lab, uh, which is de novo gene birth and the properties of de novo genes. Okay, so let's start with uh, where do genes come from? Uh, how do you, uh, how are DNA babies born? Um, the canonical knowledge is that uh, you get new genes from duplication and divergence of old genes. And so this begs the question, where do you get old genes from? And uh, according to the canon, you get old genes from duplication and divergence of older genes, which quickly leads us to a chicken and egg paradox, um, which we must resolve. And we can resolve this in uh, one of two ways. One, we can imagine a situation in which in the primordial soup of life, when from whence all current life that exists uh, emerged. We had an ancient Big Bang of all genes that now exist, and all current genes are duplicates or neo-functional or sub-functional copies of these ancient Big Bang genes. Uh, another hypothesis um, says that the, the process of natural selection acting on the biochemistry of life could continuously produce new genes from junk DNA. And this, although it seems kind of far-fetched, uh, has caught the attention of many biologists in uh, recent studies. And I'll just uh, quickly point to a review by Aoife and Daniela uh, regarding de novo gene ev evolution in eukaryotic lineages. And so in this review, they pretty systematically go over a bunch of case examples in which we have very strong evidence uh, in which you can track the junk DNA sequence and its subsequent uh, species-specific uh, expression as a protein-coding gene. Um, so I won't get into de novo genes too much, but what I will say is, given that you have this process of de novo gene emergence, what you can then do is uh, start to look for categorizing the dates of these proteins. <clears throat> so we, what we can do here in this graph is, for instance, take all the genes in a focal species, and in this case it's mouse, and what we'll do is we'll age uh, or date every single gene. And so we'll look for homology with all, uh, all the genes versus all species for which we have sequence, protein sequence data, and in this case, these genes have homology with all rodents. Uh, these would have uh, homology with all tetrapods, and if you go all the way back uh, to the uh, beginning of the tree of life, these would have homology all the way with something like E. coli. The vast majority of genes are here, as you can see from the size of the confidence intervals. Um, but we, what we can do once we have this phylostratigraphy is uh, start to ask questions about the properties of these genes. And so on the y-axis, what I've plotted here is uh, intrinsic structural disorder. And that's essentially just how floppy are these proteins. So high instru uh, intrinsic structural disorder leads to these very floppy proteins that don't have very um, characteristic uh, beta sheets and alpha helices and nice tight folds. Uh, these are very uh, kind of spaghetti-like proteins. And low intrinsic, intrinsic structural disorder means that these uh, proteins have very regular crystallizable structures um, and a, you know, very uh, tight hydrophobic residues that are packed within the core of the protein. And when we infer the intrinsic structural disorder from uh, all these mouse genes, what we see is a very clear trend of increasing intrinsic structural disorder uh, from oldest to youngest. And uh, I'll just say a caveat is that this is all based off of our ability to date these genes, and that is based off of our ability to detect homology. And there is homology detection bias. Um, so you can imagine a situation where instead of these genes being truly intrinsically, or young genes being truly intrinsic, intrinsically structurally disordered, um, intrinsically structured, uh, structurally disordered proteins uh, instead evolve at a higher rate. That leads to more difficulty in detecting homology, and then because of that, you would classify it as a younger gene. 
So what we can do then is just go back and take all the same genes <clears throat> and we can get DNDS values uh, with mouse rat comparison and then we can use a linear mixed effects model to plot the same mean intrinsic structural disorder uh, for each gene. Um, and in this case what we've done actually is collapsed all the genes into gene families. And the reason we do that is because you can't treat each individual gene as an independent data point because members of the same gene family will have shared evolution, evolutionary histories. So you can see here with a DNDS correction, it doesn't change the shape of the trend. It increases the confidence intervals for certain um, phylostrata, um, you know, but uh, the, the general trend is the same. Okay. So why would younger genes have higher intrinsic structural disorder than older genes? Um, so one way we can start to address this question is to get a control. And one control we can use is intergenic sequence. So we'll gather two intergenic sequences uh, for every gene that we have in this comparison. And we'll just create our own ORFs and we'll translate uh, those intergenic sequences into amino acids and we'll ask ourselves, what is the structural disorder of those uh, random polypeptides? Before I give you the solution, I'm going to give you two hypotheses that will uh, allow us to predict what we should expect. The first is this so-called continuum hypothesis, where uh, ORFs can be placed on an evolutionary continuum ranging from non-genic sequences to genic sequences. And this uh, was first proposed in this paper that was published in Nature that looked at these uh, recently evolved genes and so-called protogenes that were potentially evolving in yeast. And according to the continuum hypothesis then, if we were to go and uh, look at intrinsic structural disorder of all these intergenic sequences, their intrinsic structural disorder should look uh, very high and then in, in this very continuous fashion it should decrease all the way to old genes. There's another hypothesis though which we term the uh, pre-adaptation hypothesis that says that young genes should actually be extreme deviations from a random sequence. And the reason we expect this is because if you were to just translate random sequence, by chance you wouldn't get something that would be a very functional protein. You would more likely get something that was toxic or uh, that would create uh, amyloid aggregates. And so uh, natural selection will uh, purge those harmful variants that are in non-coding sequence before facilitating the process of gene birth. And this would lead to higher intrinsic structural disorder for young genes, but very, very low uh, structural disorder for uh, random intergenic sequence. And so when we did this for mouse, this is exactly what we found, that intergenic sequence or polypeptides from intergenic sequence have the lowest intrinsic structural disorder um, of any in these uh, category. And so now we can ask ourselves something about specifically about uh, the sequences. So what is it about the sequences of the amino acids in these peptides that makes them so uh, disordered or uh, so different from just random sequence? And so what we can do is with every single gene what we'll do is just scramble the amino acids, sh completely shuffle the order at random, and then recalculate the intrinsic structural disorder. And you can see for very old genes, they have essentially the exact same uh, predicted intri intrinsic structural disorder. And that means that basically the entire order of the protein is predicted by the particular amino acids that are in the protein. Uh, this is not as uh, strong in young genes. And in fact, because these are paired comparisons, um, genes are actually much uh, more disordered than you would expect just from their random uh, uh, composition of amino acids. And uh, so this suggests that order is important in young genes. Okay, so why would there be a difference in intrinsic structural disorder between old genes and young genes? Is it just because uh, intrinsic disorder is somehow favored in young genes or is, are we really picking up something else? Um, so we think that uh, Avoiding aggregation is probably the largest selective constraint on the evolution of no, new proteins. And so if you take a bunch of random sequences and you calculated intrinsic structural disorder and something like aggregation propensity using a program like Tango, you would see that these two metrics are intrinsically correlated. And so um, we expect uh, there to be signal in 
that's representative of both of these two things. And so in this case, because they're negatively correlated, I'll just say that um, the trends should be the opposite uh, than what we saw for intrinsic structural disorder. And so when we go and we calculate aggregation propensity, that's exactly what we see, is that uh, oldest genes have the highest aggregation propensity, youngest genes have the lowest, and genes in general have much lower aggregation propensity than, in, uh, than random sequence that you would get from intergenic regions. And so this is commensurate with the pre-adaptation hypothesis because if there's selection to prevent uh, aggregation at all costs, you create these polypeptides which are uh, largely filled with hydrophilic residues. They have the lowest aggregation propensity. And then only over time do you start to add, incorporate hydrophobic residues to get folds and complex structures and domains. Um, but it takes natural selection a while for uh, you to incorporate these hydrophobic residues. And we can do the same thing, and we can scramble the order of the amino acids. Um, the results in this case are a little bit different. And what we find is that uh, for old genes, they are less aggregation prone than you would expect just by their sequence composition. And this is not uh, uh, really the case for young genes. And in, in some cases, you can actually see uh, that uh, genes are actually more aggregation prone than you would specific, uh, predict just by their amino acid sequence, like for instance in this phylostratum. And so this puzzled us a little bit because we wouldn't expect uh, there to be any selection for aggregation propensity, but we assumed that this was actually something else going on. And so when we consulted our biochemist collaborators, we started talking about the position of these hydrophobic residues within a protein. And so what you can do is you can take these amino acid sequences and you can look at how clustered these hydrophobic residues are within a protein. And if you just scattered hydrophobic residues in a protein, by chance you would get this kind of Poisson expectation that's very random, and this is given by this dotted line. And what you see is that old genes are over-dispersed, so their uh, hydrophobic residues are less clumped in a protein than you would expect just by chance. In young genes, uh, the hydrophobic residues tend to be more clumped. And so this is probably the, one of the most beautiful trends um, that I've ever produced in a plot because this shows a, a, a gradient all the way back to the beginning of life that suggests that as you're creating proteins, it takes billions of years to scatter uh, hydrophobic residues across a protein in, a, in such a way that they form these beautiful folds uh, that tuck all the hydrophobic residues within the core. And so biochemists and structural biologists who you know, we're working on the protein prob folding problem from linear sequence shouldn't be too hard on themselves because natural selection takes billions of years to get these structures to form. And so in conclusion, I'll just say that uh, strongly deleterious aggregation is a constant threat to the formation of new genes and new proteins. And because of that, the easiest way to, for you to form a new protein is to just choose uh, or to use hydrophilic residues. Um, and this creates uh, intrinsically destructured pro uh, disordered proteins. Um, once you start developing folds and domains in a protein, you start incorporating hydrophobic residues, but they tend to be clumped, and that leads them to aggregate. And so selection will disfavor them and eventually spread those uh, hydrophobic residues more evenly across a protein. This takes billions of years and, um, to find these better solutions that tolerate higher hydrophobicity in a protein, um, event eventually flipping the dispersal of hydrophobicity um, so that they're over-dispersed. And uh, with that, I'll just thank uh, the funding and uh, the collaborators that made this work possible. Thanks. I have time for a question. So, uh, very nice. Is there uh, uh, anything about codon bias selection for translation accuracy being different between old and young genes given this? Yeah, so the question is, uh, if you look at all these mouse genes, is there evidence of uh, codon bias, so selection for uh, particular codons and not just amino acids? Um, we haven't looked at that specifically, but that would be uh, another thing we could check. Is it on? Yeah, I wonder that because protein folding is computationally predicted, um, could there be like, because uh, most of the, 
like most of the protein folding were uh, resolved from the older protein, so the prediction for younger protein is not as good, and that will bias your estimation. Yeah, so that could be an issue, uh, for instance, if older proteins have a systematic bias in terms of whether or not an amino acid gets called as hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Um, we haven't, uh, I think part of uh, testing that would be maybe to use different programs and things like that, which we've used, but we've typically found the best results with IUPRED. Um, but we haven't tested for a specific bias that would be present in, like computationally, in, uh, because of predict them being designed on old proteins. Unfortunately, we have to move on. Oh. Apologies. Uh, the, ne the next talk is by Julia Piper.